Welcome back to Acer P Bonsai. This week we unlock the secrets of Japanese maple aeroponic propagation using this 144 cell aeroponic propagator. If you already have an aeroponic propagator, stick around to the end of the video where I'll show a few additional tips that I've discovered through experimentation. So our basic setup consists of the lower water tray, which is basically just a large tub. The upper tray consists of 144 cells where an individual plant cutting can reside. Each of those cells is capped with one of these neoprene plugs. As you can see, they open up in a star formation, and then there's a little hole in the center where the stem can go. So we're gonna use these to set our plants into the tray. And there's our final plug there. All right, so now that we have our plugs in place, let's take a look inside of the propagator. We have this little setup here, and these are all sprinklers. Down here is a water pump. There's a little notch in the side here where you can run the power cord out through the edge. And then the pump here has some suction cups on the bottom, and we can stick that down into the center of our water trough. The little sprinkler heads can be twisted to make sure that they're pointing in the right direction and covering all of the surface. And then those will be spraying water up into the upper chamber, hitting the bottoms of the stems. The advantage of an aeroponic propagator over a hydroponic system is in a hydroponic system, you're periodically flooding and then draining the water out. With an aeroponic system, you're constantly spraying those roots or cuttings and allowing them to stay moist, but also maximizing the aeration. They have maximum oxygen available to them because they're never fully submerged in water. And that tends to produce an even more vigorous root growth. And I want you guys to see the functioning of this pump before we close it up. But it's so heavy once I fill it with water that I'm gonna just use this full of water here to the side and I'm gonna submerge the pump in that so that y'all can see I'm gonna to top that off with a little bit more water. See if we can fully submerge that pump just for demonstration purposes here. And I think that will be enough. Moment of truth here, folks. And there is the sprinkler system. Now that we've made a complete mess with water, we're gonna go ahead and move this inside to my propagation tent. All right, folks, so now we're inside of my garage. I'm not being sponsored by anyone, unfortunately. This is a Vivo Sun, two foot by four foot by five feet tall grow tent. And then I've also got a 150 watt Mars Hydro grow light here. And that's gonna keep our little cuttings nice and bright. Then off to the side here, I'm using this extension cord timer. We've got the light set up on an 18 hour light cycle uh, to simulate uh, midsummer. That's gonna be over here on the switch side of my plug. This side over here is where I'll plug in my pump uh, and this is the always on side of the switch. So that pump will always be running. Panning down, you can see that here we have our setup at the bottom of the grow tent. So now that we're in close, I also wanted to just highlight that this lid has a few of these movable uh, portholes. So you can have them in the closed position like that, or you can have them in the open position to allow a little bit of ventilation. There's one, two, three, four of these vent hole setups with four holes per site. So depending on the status of my cuttings, I'll have those either open or closed. Generally, I like to leave them open, uh, but if it's too hot or I'm just having trouble with humidity, I may keep those in the closed position. That all is gonna depend on your individual setup, how often you have time to come and check the humidity level of this tray. So we'll take that off there, and then we'll lift our upper tray off. We have our sprinkler system reattached with suction cups to the center. So the next step is gonna be filling this up with water. Filling this reservoir up with water from the sink. My household water does run through a resin filter and activated carbon, uh, so it is very clean. These little lumps are the foot where the upper tray will rest. So we wanna bring it up to that level, making sure that our pump is fully submerged. Throughout the propagation cycle, I'm gonna check this about once a week to ensure that the water level never drops below the level of this pump. If that happens, you can burn out the pump, which would be expensive and a pain in the butt to replace. So make sure you're always keeping an eye on your water level. All you need to do is top it off with a little bit of additional tap water or purified water if you have that on hand. All right, so I picked up this cloning solution. It can be used for aeroponic or hydroponic applications. The directions on the back say to use five uh, to 10 milliliters 
of solution per every liter of water. Now this is used for general plant propagation. You can probably imagine what it's most likely used for. Japanese maples don't require a high level of nutrients. So what I do in about eight gallons of water here, I'm just gonna add about one cap per gallon versus the uh, one cap per liter. So about a quarter to you know one fifth dilution. The nutrients will obviously help nourish the plant as it's growing those roots, but an excessive amount of the nutrient can also cause an algae bloom in your system. So overdoing it can be a problem as well. Although it's possible to use an antifungal or an anti-algae agent in here, I like to keep things as minimal as possible. I tend to lean toward the organic OMRI type setup. So just a little bit of nutrients to help those roots thrive, and we're gonna leave it at that. The next step is gonna be collecting some cuttings. I've got this bowl of water here, and I am gonna just add a little bit of rooting hormone into it. And I'm just gonna slurry that up so that as soon as those cuttings hit this water, they're gonna soak up a little bit of water and get a little bit of that rooting hormone. All right, let's get outside and pick out some nice cuttings. All right, so here we are in front of my Arakawa mother tree, and this side of the tree has really shot out some nice growth. You can see these nice thick stems here. That's gonna make for a great cutting. You can see I've got a location here where I have a branch left and right. Because this is such a, a rare cultivar and I only have the one tree, I really don't want to reduce this tree any farther than I have to. So what I'm gonna do, this is second year wood right here, but I'm gonna cut right there, and then I'm gonna be maintaining that fork, and that's gonna increase the ramification on the tree while also giving me these cuttings. So I'm gonna drop this down into my bowl of rooting hormone. We're also looking for growth that has fully hardened off. You can see here, we've got a nice hunter green color. Some of these newer shoots still have a little bit of lime green and red showing. So these are not quite hardened off. We wanna select shoots with a hardened cuticle. These are gonna lose less water during transpiration and that's gonna be less likely to wilt uh, while we're waiting for this new cutting to uh, root. Here's another strong one right here. The more vigorous shoots are gonna have a lot more energy. Oh yeah, if you guys can see this one here, this extended really nicely. It is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six and a half nodes long. The ends here are not hardened off, so we're gonna end up sacrificing those. But I do want to take that. You can see we got a little spider nest there. We wanna get rid of that. That's not gonna help us. And then these upper shoots are not likely to sprout. So I'm gonna cut that off there. It's probably just gonna die off on us. So there's our good shoot. All right, so what I've done there is I actually cut it in the second year wood there. Here's the beginning of our shoot in spring, and I'm gonna see if I can work with that as a cutting. We've got a pretty good collection of Arakawa cuttings here. Let's move on to our next tree. Here we are with my large Benny Maiko. This is essentially a dwarf Shindishoujo. Really beautiful tree. It starts out vivid red in the spring, and then it turns to this nice hunter green color and it will go red again in the fall. Just a beautiful little tree. Uh, one other trait on this Benny Maiko is it tends to be a little bit more pendulous or contorted. So you'll see some of these branches that just twist and turn, not as upright as uh, a regular Deshojo or Shin Deshojo. So beautiful little tree, small leaf size, but essentially the color pattern of a Deshojo or Shin Deshojo. This one's looking pretty good. It's extended quite nicely and the leaves have hardened off. They're fully green. So this is gonna be a great option for us. Any area where we can be doing some pruning for shape is always a good idea and a recommendation for where we're gonna take our cuttings because we don't wanna detract from the shape of our tree. We wanna improve the quality of our tree while also providing ourselves with the cuttings. We have a nice little handful. You can see there's a little bit of fungal damage. That's the thrips that we're hopping around in springtime. I did my best to spray this with an herb oil and neem solution, but this is not gonna damage the tree permanently. None of that fungus is gonna enter the vascular system. It's simply a little bit of discoloration and damage to those leaves. All right, so I think we've got enough Benny Maiko. Let's move on to our next tree. This is my second copy of that US Sagan that turned out to be a Deshojo. If you look in there, you can see that we've got a twin trunk. This is eventually gonna be a great bonsai, but for now it's mostly just gonna be a mother tree. If you look inside of here, you can see some crazy twisting that I've uh, been putting into some of these trunk lines, like this one here and this one up top. So this is gonna end up being an air layer. I'm also gonna air layer that here in the next couple of weeks. But we've got these long extensions, so I'm gonna take some of these to use as rooted cuttings. Because these are so similar in appearance to the Benny Maiko, we need to make absolutely sure that we keep these on a separate side of the bowl and we don't get them confused. Take that entire thing. Branches toward the apex of the tree tend to have 
a little bit more vigor. So taking your cuttings from the top are gonna to be great. If you look at this really closely, you can see that this, it really just expresses that beautiful pink color. So it started out fire engine red, and then it went green, and you can see that pink variegation starting to show through. Such an interesting plant. We don't want to overly weaken this air layer. We want to make sure it has plenty of leaves to produce vigorous roots when we set that up. So I've got my Benny Maiko on that side. I've got my Arakawa kind of in the middle. And then over on this side, I've kept all of these second Sagan slash the Shoujo. These are Benichi Dori. Very hard to find in the United States. A uh, big thank you to Backcountry Dan or Dan the Maple Man, if you know him on Instagram. Dan, thank you so much for keeping me in mind once you were able to get these trees in the country. So because these are so rare, this is like gold. The other cuttings are amazing, but these are gold. We really want to maximize the success of these rooted cuttings while also not negatively impacting the structure of these young trees. As you can see, this tree over here has some pretty decent wire scars on it from the previous owner. This one is in near mint condition, very minimal wire scarring. So this is probably my best specimen of the two. I do want to take a few of these cuttings but when I do that, we're going to be very careful to select for structure. We're not going to reduce any of this ramification where we don't need to, but we do want to get the maximum number of cuttings. So I'm going to take one from right there. And as you can see, some of these have a little bit of movement. I wired these earlier in the year. So I'm going to reduce that one there, take that one there. I took all of those cuttings from the apex for maximum vigor. This little tree here, I'm going to take one cutting right there. For this tree, I could take this one off the top here. I don't want to slow down its growth, so I'm going to leave this cutting. We can always take that later as an air layer. I'd like to see this tree catch up in growth with this tree. Took a little bit of that strength out of the apex to help balance the energy to the other branches. We've gotten ourselves a nice clutch of cuttings. All right, we've got our Benici Dori added to the bouquet. Let's continue on to the next tree. Here we have a very young Hubble Super Cork. And you can see I've got a few wires on it. I'm setting up some movement for future air layers. And I also do want to take some cuttings off these stronger shoots growing at the apex. Hubble Super Cork is an interesting, it's in that Arakawa family. It's gonna get that nice piney bark. Uh, apparently this one corks up much more quickly than an Arakawa or a Nishikigawa. So I'm excited to see how these little cuttings do, watching to see how quickly it corks up. This is a really nice shoot. Look at that, it's super long. I'm going to get several cuttings out of that and I'm going to cut that right back to the base there. We've actually got one, two, three shoots coming out of this apex, so I'm also going to take this other one here. There's no reason to have that kind of knuckling on a tree like this. We've got this nice twisted up guy. We're going to let those thicken up. These were the strongest branches on the tree. Let's let the rest be so that this tree can continue to gain strength. Here we are with my Oridono Nishiki forest and the mother tree has absolutely exploded. And I'm going to go in here and I'm gonna look for the most vigorous shoots. We will take those for air layers. You probably can't see at the back, but I'm gonna reduce the second year wood because of how vigorous it is. A little chunk there, just gonna take that out. With this Oridono Nishiku, we also wanna make sure that we're grabbing shoots that have nice variegation. If they're lacking that variegation, they could be reversions. And we always wanna be propagating the absolute best material we can. I'd love to make more of these just so I can add to this forest. So this one's a priority on the propagation list this year. We're gonna come back and handle the pruning on this tree later. For now, we're happy with just collecting these cuttings. Probably the only thing more valuable than my Benici Dori over there is this true Sagan. That because I just acquired this tree, I've decided to wait on this air layer till next year to make sure I know that it is nice and strong and vigorous. But if I can find a few little shoots up here in the apex to propagate, I would like to give it a try. This really is not a super strong tree, but I just can't help myself. I need to give it a try here. So there's one little shoot. I can remove structural flaws. So what I have up here at the apex, a little branch that splits into three. So I'm going to take one of those. So I'm improving the structure and I'm also getting myself a little cutting. This cutting propagation is a super important tool when working with minimal material, really small branches we're working with here. Remove that as well. Okay, I don't really wanna to do too much more. This is a really nice little tree. We're gonna see if we can keep these alive. Authentic Sagan imported from Japan. Really excited about this little tree and there will be more time to propagate this in the future. Next spring, I'm gonna move this tree into a big wooden box 
and I'm going to let these branches run so that I can get some really nice uh, cutting stock like the other ones you saw me collect earlier. So let's get these in the water. We're back into the garage with our propagation setup. Here's hack number one. I've got here an aquarium heater and I've got it set to 82 degrees. This is going to maintain the temperature of the water. We're going to ensure that the reservoir stays at 82 degrees at all times and that's going to maintain a nice consistent temperature to maximize root growth. Let's get our upper tray in place, pump line in the front. We've got our heater line running out the back. All right, so the next step in the process is trimming our cuttings down to size. We want to make sure that there's always a node, and then below that is where the roots are going to emerge. So you can see that there's a nice little node line here, and then we want to make sure that we have at least one, two nodes of leaves. So this is our little cutting. We're going to start here with this Hubble Super Cork. You can identify this one because it has these kind of contorted leaves. Otherwise, it looks basically like an Arakawa. All right, so I've got a little bowl and I'm going to pour some of the rooting hormone into that. To dip all of our cuttings. All right, so we're gonna dip, dip, dip. Make sure we have the hormone on that. We'll grab our little plug and then we're going to insert it like so. Want to make sure that we have at least one node line below the plug and just like that we're going to insert it back into its location when i first used this setup last time i was leaving big gaps between each of my cuttings and i found that that didn't really matter i was worried about fungus and all kinds of things and it really wasn't an issue once i got started moving down we've got one cutting removed and you can see now the next node is there so we actually need to remove these leaves like so, can break those off. Usually I'll get rid of those little nubs. I don't want those leaves to try to grow. But because this aeroponic propagator keeps such a nice high humidity, diagonal cuts on these cuttings is not necessary. In fact, it's probably better to do a straight cut and that's gonna encourage radial roots to grow from all angles. So we've cleaned up the bottom node, we've cut a straight cut. We're gonna leave two sets of leaves and there's our next cutting. So we're gonna repeat just like that. All right, folks, we are all loaded up with our various cuttings. We have Hubble Super Cork over here. We have Benichi Dori here, Benny Maiko here, Oridono Nishiki, Arakawa, that U.S. Sagan variety slash the shoujo with the excellent pink variegation. And then finally, on the end, we have these four little, the true Sagans. And just since we're on that topic, I wanted to zoom in really close. All right, so here we have that U.S. Sagan, which is clearly showing the leaf shape of a Deshojo. It has the characteristic red, green, red. It does, however, tend to throw a little bit more of that midsummer variegation than your typical Deshojo. So possibly it is a slightly different cultivar, but it is most certainly not Sagan. Now that I have it on hand, I can see it here. The Sagan leaves are a lot smaller. As you can see, these Sagan leaves have a lot narrower lobe with a longer star shape. They are gonna be in five lobes or seven lobes, you can see on some of the larger leaves, but definitely a different leaf shape. And then these are going to leaf out in that beautiful pink color in the spring. So we'll look forward to seeing these next year. Hopefully these four little cuttings take. I'm very excited, but as you can see, we've got a really nice tray of cuttings here. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and plug in that pump to the always on extension cord. You can hear it coming online. Once we put that lid on, it is a nice humidity chamber, but I've found that this tends to dry out a little bit. So my super simple hack to maintain humidity is you're going to lift up one of these plugs. Let me lift this one up here in the front so you can see. All right, so now that I've lifted that up and put it on an angle, you can see that the water is spraying out of there. I'm gonna get in close so you can see that. And you can see that I've lifted up one of these plugs that isn't occupied and the water is gonna spray out of there. This will create a little bit of a mess and eventually we can expect a little bit of algae growth here, but that's gonna maintain a nice humidity underneath the lid at all times so you don't have to focus on coming back, spraying it down with a spray bottle. A little crack like that and you're gonna be off to the races. This thing's gonna maintain its humidity nicely even with those vents open and you should have a perfect setup here. Now because it can cause a mess, I've decided I'm actually gonna close this one it's next to my Benici Dories here. These are the 
probably the second most valuable in this tray. The first most value being these Sagans over here. So I'm gonna, I've got those up at the front of the container. I'm actually gonna pop a crack back here in the back corner. And that's gonna spray just out to this back here. Once I get the lid on, it's going to direct that spray back down the side. It'll collect in here and it'll drip back down into the reservoir so it won't cause any issue. So there you have it, your second hack. We're going to come back in here with our dome and put that over the top. I press it down on the corners to make sure it's well seated. We've got our vents all in the open position so that we can get a little bit of aeration. Then we have our cracked open plug in the back corner to continue to add a little bit of spray. We will see you in about two to three weeks and show you the results. Thanks for joining me in another episode of ACP Bonsai. Bonsai.